Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are in our 33rd year, I talk to writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished in the past, what they might be planning for the future. It's a slightly wider net than writers, however. We have had on painters, we've had on musicians, we've had on actors. So if you have an idea for a guest who might be a good fit for the writer's block, a writer or other brand of artist, please watch for our address at the end of the credits at the end of the show. I also want to remind you that the writer's block and all the other original programming that comes out of 16 23 Studios is the result of cable access television. It's a wonderful community service for Gloucester and all of Cape Ann, and you don't get it if you get internet service by any other means than cable. So stick with cable, stick with the writer's book. I'm very happy today to say that we do have a writer. She is Judith Freeze Wright, who has written a book about her. her activity as a young woman, as a freedom writer in the South. The book is called Acts of Resistance, and I'm really looking forward to talking to her about it. Judy Wright, welcome to the Writer's Block. Thank you. Thank you. I mentioned that I wanted to plug the book, so I'm going to plug it right now. I'm going to okay. hold it up and ask Tyler if he can get a close-up of this on one of the cameras, as a central camera, because we didn't have a, a, a real good JPEG a picture of it. Yes. But I want to make sure that everybody knows what the cover looks like when they get it from Amazon, or I hope maybe downtown Gloucester. So. It will be downtown Gloucester at the bookstore. Okay, good. It'll be downtown Gloucester at the bookstore. That's Acts of Resistance. Now, this is important for our readers to get to know you, our, our TV audience to get to know you. It also is important for the book. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, not too far from here. No, Newton, Massachusetts. Yep. So the, the pretty white, pretty well-off suburbs of Boston. Definitely, definitely. I, it was a different kind of community than where I was going when I went to Mississippi. The, a different kind of community than than where I went to in Mississippi yes, later yeah, on. Yes. It was pretty much all white, um, many, many Jewish people there. Um, and I had a pretty simple, easy, and happy life while I lived there. But then it became, and you, you, you record these, uh, these incidents and these moments of revelation in the book in chronological order. It's very suspenseful. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what happened to your awareness of world and national events? Well, it started out very simply in Newton when my parents gave me the book Exodus uh, for a birthday present. And um, it's the story of the Jewish people trying to establish a homeland in what was then Palestine. And um, it's not so much because I'm Jewish, but there was something about the roles that the, the characters in that book were playing to fight for something that they really believed in that got to me. And it started a feeling in me that I didn't want my life to be useless. I wanted to do something with my life that would make a difference in the world. I wanted to find something that I really believed in and act on it. And it stayed in my heart always. And then when I was in college... What, what birthday did they give you Exodus for? What, what, oh, what I was a teenager. You? I don't remember exactly. But before college, high school? Oh, it was before college. But I, when I went to college, um, I remember seeing the story of the sit-ins. And um, I was bowled over by it. I was both excited and scared for them, scared for the people who were getting arrested. And I kept following that. And then when I was a senior in college, I remember sitting on my bed in my, in my bedroom and seeing the stories about the first Freedom Riders. And that really affected me deeply. And I 
was glued to the TV after that, watching all the news about it. And by the time I finished college, I had made up my mind that, yes, I wanted to be part of this movement. And I went, where, where did you go to college? I went to college at Smith College in New Hampshire. Where? I mean, in, in Western Massachusetts. I'm sorry. So, uh, from being a freshman in college to a senior, your consciousness about what was going on in the South, <clears throat> or at least in part because of the Freedom Riders, grew. Yes, it and grew. Your Absorbed me more and more. Yeah. <laughs> so, you finally decided. You have to yeah. do something. Yes, so I, did, I went to New York to sign up. Tell me about your parents' reaction when oh, my you parents. informed them that you were going to go south. My parents were very upset. Um, not that they didn't think it was a good thing to do, but they were being protective of me. Um, three boys had just been killed in Meridian, Mississippi um, by the Klan and that was all over the newspapers, three boys that were involved in the movement. Um, and, and also my parents were very worried because I had asthma, and they were afraid of me being in jail. It was clear that buying a ticket on one of those freedom rides was buying a ticket to jail. And they tried to convince me to do something else besides go, go there. Make but, phone calls or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I think most parents would have reacted the same way. Yeah. I understood that they were terrified for me. Um, but they did make a deal with me that I could go see the family doctor who has known our family since I was a child and ask him what he thought. And I did. I went to see him, and he hesitated for a minute. And then he said, Judy, your parents can't be everything to you. You should go. And when my parents heard that, they kept their word, and they supported me in every way possible. Good for them. Yeah, it was Good hard. It was hard for them, but they did it. Um, and so I did go. Um, and I'm so glad I did. And this is, in, this is in the early 60s. This was in 1961, at the very beginning of the Freedom Ride. Um, they did go on through, it was in June of 61, and the Freedom Rides went on through the summer. Um, so I wasn't on the first, second, or third bus, but I was right there near the beginning. So as, as I mentioned, your book uh, is in chronological order. Yeah. And I want to say there's nice suspense from you, will she decide to go or not? What yeah. will her parents say? Those, those yeah. steps are very... Uh, very uh, interesting, and yeah. you're, 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 the reader's anxious to find out what happens next. Yeah. So you, I think you, you expected to go back home for a couple of weeks or yes, a month. But and, and what, what happened? Well, I went to New York to the core office to sign up, and the person who was interviewing me tried to tell me all the truths about things that could happen if I went. Painful truths. Painful truths about people getting jailed and getting hurt in jail, and not, no help coming. Um, and he wanted to be sure that I knew all that. And I was kind of rummaging myself inside listening to all this. But being 22 years old, young, and thinking I was invulnerable, I said, yes, I can do it. And yeah, then you, they, were, you were 22. Yeah. Or he was 22. I was 22. You were 22. So, um, I told him, yes, I wanted to go. And then he told me, OK, I was going to leave from New York in two days. And I had thought I was going to be coming home and waiting for them to call on me. But it was done right then. And then I spent the next day um, learning about um, protecting myself, going, going limp if, if the police came, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the next day, I left for Atlanta to meet um, eight other Freedom Riders and become a, be part of that group, which was an integrated group. Were these other eight uh, from all over the country, or were they from the Northeast as well? They weren't all from the Northeast. There were some from Atlanta. 
Um, I can't remember one, one from New York. I can't remember where they all came from. The Freedom Riders as a group represented all parts of the country. But in the end, there were over 400 of us. This was near the beginning. And um, they represented America completely, all over and all kinds. So when did you go on your first? Well, then you got from Atlanta to Mississippi. Yes, in Atlanta, our, our group met. And we bought tickets to go on the Freedom Ride knowing, as I said, that we would going, be going through Alabama and then Mississippi, um, and where we would be arrested and go to jail. Um, we sat in the middle of the bus get, as, as an integrated group, because at that time, um, black people always had to sit in the back of the bus. And the purpose of the Freedom Rides was to there was, all, excuse me, there was already a law that it was illegal to segregate interstate transportation. And the purpose of the Freedom Rides was to, make, to publicize that that wasn't being done and to make the federal government insist that the southern states stop segregating interstate travel stop segregating the bus stops, the waiting rooms, the water fountains, and everything that went with. So what the Freedom Riders were doing was simply exercising their legal and legislated rights. Exactly. And the officers and the politicians who suppressed that were completely outside the law. Yes, exactly. And not only was the goal of the Freedom Rides to desegregate, public transportation. But I think it was also meant to wake up the country. Because though people knew that the South was segregated, unless you lived right there, you probably didn't think about it a lot in those days. And so the, the goal was to put so many people in jail from all over the country, young, innocent people, <laughs> that there would be a tremendous amount of publicity about it, and people, people would wake up and start um, change their it, wake up their politics about this. And as far as the media is concerned, yes. it's important to have white people yes. arrested because the press doesn't pay exactly. much attention if a black person's arrested. That's true. That was absolutely true. And if all the Freedom Riders has, had been black, there wouldn't have been the same kind of publicity. So it was important for white people to take part. So tell us about the, uh, uh, the ride that got you in uh, trouble with the law. Well, um, when we left Atlanta, we were, as I said, in the middle of the bus in an integrated group. The white people that got on the bus looked at us pretty angrily, and it was hard to tell if they were angry because they had read about previous Freedom Riders and were angry to be put on a bus with more of them because they didn't know what would happen. Some of them didn't even look at them. They look at us. They might have been frightened. They might have been angry. And as the bus started along, we, we drove into Alabama, and I remember um, sitting in this same integrated group in the middle of the bus, Wyatt T. Walker, who was executive director of the Southern Leadership Congress, which was Martin Luther King's group, faced all of us and started to talk as we were getting near Birmingham, Alabama. He said, if we get attacked, all of us must, must around Henry Schwartz Child, who was one of us, who was the only white man in the group, because the Southerners are going to be most angry and most want to attack a white man who's fighting for civil rights. The next to be attacked would be the black man, then the black woman, and last of all, the white woman. 
And he said, if you're a white woman and you're attacked, just scream as loud as you can and maybe they'll have mercy on you. Uh, did, did he say that on the bus while you were traveling? Yes, he said or that. the general public on the bus as well? Well, he wasn't talking that loud. I'm oh. not sure how many other people. There was us in the middle and then a space in front of us, a space in back of us, and then all the other black people were sitting in the back of the bus and the white people were sitting in the front. So I don't know how much they heard, but he was giving us a plan to follow if we were going to get attacked. As it happened, when we got to Birmingham, there were police everywhere, and all the onlookers, the white onlookers, were being held back because the white, first of all, the, the federal government had decided that they didn't want any more Freedom Riders because they were causing too much trouble. And if the, um, if, if the government in Alabama would stop letting people be attacked, the news would go away. And then maybe the Corps and SNCC could proceed on a less aggressive way to attack the problem. And also, um, uh, suddenly it's escaping my, a uh, Ross Barnett, who was, he was um, the, the head of the police in Birmingham. And he wanted all the attacks to stop too, because he felt if the publicity stopped, then they could go back to their own way of life without all this mess of the Freedom Riders coming through. You have a quotation there from Rosberg. He's the, he was the chief of police in yes. Birmingham. Yes. Can you read that uh, for us? Yes, please? I I would. This is how he felt about segregation in the South. The good Lord was the original segregationist. He put the black man in Africa. He made, the, he made us white because he wanted us white, and he intended that we should stay that way. So that was his feelings about any progress about racism in the South. Yeah. And so, any, so he had arranged that day that we arrived, he had arranged that there would be no violence because he just wanted the whole thing to go away. Tell us uh, what happened on the ride at the end of which you wound up at, I think the official name is Parchman Farm? Yes. Not quite a farm in the way we usually <laughs> no. think of a farm. Um, we, were, um, we, we got back on the bus after spending a night in Birmingham in black people's homes. We had our night there. We got back on the bus and drove into Jackson, Mississippi, where we were arrested and sent to the Hines County Jail, which was the local jail. Um, we spent our, a couple of days there before um, a policeman came to the, our cell door. Our cell was all women, all white women. The blacks and whites and the different sexes were separated into separate jails. So, and he said, get ready, we're going to take you to Parchman State Penitentiary. And I had heard that it was a pretty awful place to be, so I kind of swallowed hard. And it still has that reputation. Yeah, it does, it does. Actually, if we have time later, I'll tell you about going back there for the 50th reunion. But at that time, we all got our few belongings together and got on a bus. Um, which included all of the people who were at that time in Hines County Jail. So there were blacks and whites and men and women. We all got on a bus together and drove through the Mississippi Delta. It was like a four-hour drive to Parchman State Penitentiary. Um, and um, it, was, it was a little scary. Um, we were all divided into our different groups, white women, black women. Actually, no, that's not true. I'm sorry. Women were divided from men. 
and we, the women were taken down a steep flight of stairs to a long corridor where there were separate cells that had two or three, could hold two or three people on one side of the corridor. And I remember thinking, Kennedy won't let this happen. I was so appalled by it. Um, we were divided into, this whole cell block was integrated but each separate cell was segregated. There were only white women or black women in each cell. Um, so we could hear each other, but we couldn't see each other. Oh. And <clears throat> there were two or three women in every so, cell. So you had uh, uh, an opening towards the corridor. Yes, but we not all, to the wall, not through the wall. Exactly. And we had high windows in the corridor where we could just about see the color of the sky, and that was all and no other windows in very, our cells. Very, very unlike cell Newton, Massachusetts. Very unlike. Um, so um, it was, it was um, we were not treated well, as you could imagine, because according to the, the people who were running the jail and also to the people that were um, dealing with us personally, we were outside agitators that were going to try to destroy their way of life. And um, for instance, I, as I said, had quite bad asthma in those days. They didn't have such good treatment for it. And I had brought my medication along with me. And this man, one of the trustees, whose last name was Tyson, who was kind of set a tone that was pretty mean for the whole cell block, he took away my, my medication, called me a, a drug addict, and, and I asked if I could see a doctor, and he said, no, there's no doctor on the premise now. He's on vacation. And I knew that that was a lie because there was a whole hospital. It was a huge prison. There was a whole hospital there. There had to be more than one doctor. So he took it away, and I, I was quite frightened about what my breathing would be like. But after two weeks, finally the doctor came, and he talked to me. He talked to Tyson. He said that I could have the medication. There was no reason that I couldn't have it. I was not a drug addict. And then he left, a f and so Tyson came and took it away. And um, the minute the doctor left, he took it No, I I'm sorry. Tyson gave it back to you. Yes, Tyson gave it back to me. Um, and the minute the doctor left, he came back and took it away, and I never saw it again. Um, the, men, the men were beaten in their cell block. Before the show started, you picked a passage, part of, a, part of your book, that described parchment? Did you? No. no? Oh, I thought you had. Maybe no. we were just talking oh, about yeah. it. Oh, um, yeah. I did. But there's, you can cut this out, well, right? This will give me a chance to hold the book up again. OK. I want to hold the book up again and mention a couple things about it. I'm on that camera, I think. Is that good? You know, I just. This is. This is the book, Acts of Resistance, that we've been talking about uh, with, uh, Judy, with, with Judy Wright. And uh, I want to mention that it's available on Amazon, and it will be available downtown. And also, I didn't mention before, there are many, many good black and white pictures in the book from the 60s. And those of you who know a little bit about history or are old enough to remember, uh, these black and white pictures uh, will bring back, uh, bring back that time very forcefully. Unfortunately, what I just talked about a minute ago is what I was going to read. Oh, well, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Well, so you later, I want to make a little jump here because we're down to just a few minutes. Oh. Later, after <clears throat> you were involved with the Freedom Riders, you registered voters in the South. Yes. Um, I came back from my stay at Parchment, came back to the Boston area, met my husband, got married, 
And then the two of us went to Meridian, Mississippi for a year to register voters, to teach in Freedom School, um, and do demonstrations. And registering voters was a really difficult and heartrending thing to do. Be we went out with other people from the area, always a black person and a white person together, to various neighborhoods, black neighborhoods, and knocked on the door and would try to talk to people about registering to vote. And it was something that was very hard for me because I knew if they even tried to register, if a black person even tried to register to vote, they could lose, the, it would be printed in the newspaper. They could lose their job. They could be beaten up. It wasn't a small thing that we were trying to encourage them to do. So they could be fired. And, and, and people were fired. Yes. Uh, and, and bullied uh, and, and, and uh, uh, attacked in other ways for just attempting, attempting to register. Attempting to register to vote. And tell us something about the ratio of white registered voters to black registered voters. Oh, there was a part of, of um, one town in Mississippi where there were like 3,000 um, or 4,000 white people and 2,000 something or other were white people were registered to vote, and there were maybe a thousand less black people, and only one of them. One. Only one person had managed to register to vote. It wasn't always quite that bad, but the situation was that white people, no matter how uneducated um, or poor or anything else they were, all they had to do was put an X on the line and they would be registered to vote. And you have some transcripts from yes. a couple of hearings, yes. uh, uh, courtroom hearings, actual transcripts, which show that the people, the whites interviewed, were illiterate. Yes. And they were asked to read something they said they couldn't, no, sorry, yes. can't read. But they were registered to vote. Right, right. And a school teacher yes. who had college degrees was asked to recite by memory some clause or paragraph in the Constitution. He couldn't word get for it perfect. word. Yes. She couldn't get it perfectly, so she was not allowed to write. Right. I am watching the clock. We're oh. almost out of time. Oh. I would like to love to carry this on for another half hour, but we have to make sure we don't run into the next show. Right, I understand. I want to thank you very much, Judith Wright, for sharing your experience about creating and living acts of resistance with us. Uh, I appreciate the time. It's an exciting book. And I want to urge our audience to read it. Thank you so much for asking me to come and for the chance to bring this subject up again You're in this welcome. time You're when very it's welcome. still Glad very it. relevant. I want, to, uh, I want to thank all our TV audience as well. If you've learned something about Judy Wright's adventures in the South or courageous adventures in the South and the racial conflicts of that period, which in so many ways continue today, then the writer's block has done its job. Thanks for being with us, and I hope to see you again next week on the writer's block. Good night. <laughs>